Uh, as, uh, as Susan said, Scott, Scan Scott Sanders has been called the uncontested authority on the history of Antioch College. Whether that is true or not, he joined, the he joined the Antioch community in 1994 to complete a 300-hour graduate internship that apparently continues to this day. Appointed Antioch University archivist in 1997, he held that position until 2009 during the college's suspension. Upon the separation from Antioch University that same year, he was the first employee of the new Antioch College. In recognition for his service to the college and the community, the Alumni Association honored him with its J.D. Dawson Award in 2011. He is a frequent lecturer for historical societies and other local organizations and was the keynote speaker at the annual conference of the Society of Ohio Archivists in April of 2011. In 2018, he was named a Fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society. He most recently served as Acting Director of the Olive Kettering Library for the first half of 2021 and attended Wright State University where he earned both his undergraduate and graduate degrees. He has contributed numerous articles and essays of local and institutional history and is the author of the increasingly rare anthology, Antioch, an Episodic History. When not archiving, he enjoys cribbage, old movies, live music, and baseball. He forgot to mention his cats. Since it's Catter Day, I'm going to help him out with that. He is a native of Cincinnati and has lived most of his life in Ohio. Without further ado, I give you Scott Sanders. Thank you, April. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen here and present. Uh, uh, don't forget all the images that you see today are courtesy of Antioch, Guiana, uh, the archives of Antioch College. Do you all know this guy? This is Arthur Morgan uh, as he stands in or his reasonable facsimile stands in uh, South Hall on Antioch College campus. Um, why are we talking about a man who comes from the 19th century? Uh, we understand Arthur as a, as a visionary. And if we understand his vision as looking toward a more enlightened society, then this very 19th century man, as you will see, will always remain relevant, uh, especially uh, since it appears that we live in an increasingly less enlightened society. Arthur Morgan was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, but he spent his formative years in St. Cloud, Minnesota. His uh, father was a surveyor uh, and uh, drainage expert, and that is where uh, Morgan learned uh, the trade of uh, uh, ultimately of engineering. He became a surveyor and uh, uh, spent most of his early professional life, uh, uh, the way I put it, is digging ditches, but creating drainage solutions at a time when the United States was uh, uh, reclaiming uh, vast amounts of acreage that it, what had been previously been unusable swamps. Um, this was, very nasty, dirty, lonely work. And uh, one of the outcomes from this, this experience, besides all of the uh, expertise that he gained, uh, was Morgan contracted malaria. Um, uh, he held also a variety of other jobs. Uh, uh, this is uh, Morgan as a, a timber cruiser. Uh, so, uh, again, an uh, incredibly dangerous job uh, uh, and dirty and lonely, uh, helping uh, uh, logs get down rivers so that the wood could be milled. Uh, and so you can see the spike in his hand there. That would be uh, for uh, clearing jams in a river uh, while undoubtedly standing on one or more of these logs. Uh, so uh, uh, no wallflower. Uh, Morgan, for sure. Probably the best way to understand Arthur Morgan is as a product of the progressive era, capital P progressive. Uh, this is the uh, a broad social and political movement in the United States that um, 
Morgan grew up in and came of age during, and it brought such long lasting impact to the United States as uh, improvement in working conditions, especially uh, uh, around the uh, child labor. It uh, brought uh, votes for women for the very first time. It also brought us uh, uh, temperance uh, movement that culminated in the prohibition of spirituous liquors and uh, exposed uh, through uh, what we call muckraking journalism, the, um, uh, especially the uh, squ squalid urban conditions that way too, American, way too many Americans lived in. It is the beginning of the conservation movement. Um, and it, during the progressive era, the first national parks in the United States were created. Uh, it is uh, a movement that also results in something uh, that's uh, particularly relevant for the United States today, and that is uh, expertise uh, in <clears throat> fields other than politics entering politics, best exemplified by uh, public health departments and public health districts. Uh, and so this is how... Um, Really, this um, this movement uh, seeks to improve uh, society and indeed uh, humankind. I'm not quite there yet, uh, and so it's significant to see also that the progressive movement is based on a notion that the leading progressives, the experts, uh, know what's best for you, the average American citizen, and this is another thing that is going to uh, uh, inform Arthur Morgan's approach uh, to life and his work. Uh, so his work uh, prior to becoming president of Antioch College is primarily in the field of uh, civil engineering and primarily in flood control. Uh, this is where he really makes his uh, international mark, uh, his reputation, and there is absolutely a genius uh, to Morgan's engineering that I'm not entirely sure I can explain. This is a man who did not attend engineering school. Uh, he had a total of six weeks of college, uh, but he had a lot of practical experience in how um, uh, uh, water can be both friend and foe uh, to, uh, uh, to your life. He came to the Dayton area in 19, uh, uh, following, I should say, the 1913 flood. Um, it is the greatest disaster, probably in the natural disaster, probably in the history of the state of Ohio, and <clears throat> has uh, an enormous uh, uh, human and natural and financial cost to it. Um, at that time, uh, uh, Dayton was uh, a, uh, an increasingly uh, significant industrial city, uh, producing all kinds of products that um, uh, that made the that made it a significant um, place, and the uh, business leaders in Dayton resolved that uh, the city would never be under eight feet of water again. And so, to that end, they uh, had basically an open casting call for engineers all around the uh, country uh, uh, to make sure that Dayton would never flood again, and. The man that they hired to do that was Arthur Morgan. Uh, because of this solution that he had, which actually he didn't have, he got the job because he, um, when asked what his plan would be, his answer was, I'm not sure, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, so he's a man who, uh, uh, an engineer who makes sure that he knows the lay of the land before he ever comes up uh, with a solution to the engineering problem. And in this case, the Miami Conservancy District was created um, and is, as I say, really one of the prime examples of Morgan's genius. Simply earth dams surrounding the city that uh, will um, not permit the, uh, the uh, rivers to uh, overflow. And uh, that was an enormous project. Morgan in his uh, Miami Conservancy District office um, the other component of Morgan's genius uh, 
not apart from the moving of millions of tons of earth um, <clears throat> was also the legal entity that was the, that is the Miami Conservancy District. Um, he has more than one uh, really inspired uh, legislative solution to uh, to a problem to, that goes with its engineering, and this from a man who never attended law school. Um, and we can we can see here the scope and the scale of uh, the kind of um, work that it took uh, to create the conservancy district, which continues to operate to this day. Um, as a he would have been hired by Dayton business leaders. He uh, came to know these business leaders. They uh, gathered frequently and had uh, book reading groups where they steeped themselves in the latest thinking of the day. A um, lot of it was uh, within the context of the, uh, uh, the progressive movement. And one of the things that they started uh, focusing on was what they called progressive education. And what the men that Arthur was working with wanted was uh, a change, a dramatic change in the public school system. Uh, they literally wanted people to uh, learn more about life and less about academics. Then they put this thing to the test with Arthur Morgan's uh, uh, input in a primary school that they created for their sons initially, the Moraine Park School. Uh, you see here the the cover to their very first uh, annual, starting in 1917. Uh, Charles Kettering gave over this mammoth greenhouse to the project. Uh, I can't imagine how much fun it would have been to go to a school in a, in a building like this. <clears throat> and it was here that they uh, laid out the uh, I, these ideas of what was then known as learn by doing. Um, Recently, educators have been calling this project-based learning. Uh, they saw that the, uh, and Morgan especially, saw the value of uh, work and direct experience uh, as a component of education uh, that could never take place in a classroom. We see here from their first annual, the kinds of projects that uh, these very uh, young people were doing. <clears throat> and as you can see in his first year, it was a boys' school. Uh, and so to learn about economics, for, us, for instance, the students ran a bank. Um, to learn uh, writing and uh, probably some of an industrial production, they, held, they ran a print company. Um, they, as you can see, bailed paper uh, and uh, in, to understand retail and marketing, uh, ran an electrical supplies company. Here is all of the different components of the uh, 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 of the practic practical uh, cur curriculum uh, that the kids um, studied. Um, and one of the students who attended this school was uh, Lee Morgan's dad, uh, Ernest Morgan. And so it, with these uh, uh, massive flood control projects and the um, uh, practice that Morgan had with uh, his experience with the Marine Park School uh, and, and this idea that, um, that there was uh, a value uh, to uh, uh, a community life uh, for everyone. Uh, Arthur Morgan also created a uh, worker camp to go with every uh, dam. <clears throat> and I think this is at the one at uh, Englewood. Uh, it was uh, a way that he could express his ideas about uh, shaping uh, uh, society. Uh, it's actually referred to often as social engineering, uh, but the, at, as an ever practical man, he also understood that uh, laborers building dams were better workers if they um, lived a family life uh, and had permanent housing for uh, their spouse, their children, had schools, stores, theaters, uh, and access to uh, what Morgan would call a whole life, uh, as opposed to uh, single men who abandoned their families and were uh, uh, kept in uh, tent cities. It results in a far more uh, efficient workforce that uh, 
absolutely uh, produces uh, spectacular results in Morgan's projects. So the, all of this is what brought Morgan to the area. And that is also how he ended up becoming president of Antioch College, simply being in the neighborhood. Um, he was at that time a leading figure in the Unitarian Association. And <clears throat> there was coincidentally a Unitarian uh, seat on the board of trustees of Antioch College that came open. And in 1919, to protect its interests, the Unitarian Association appointed Morgan to the board. At the time, Antioch College was uh, uh, struggling mightily. Uh, it had a very small budget. It had a very small faculty. It was still trying to be the Antioch College of the 19th century uh, under uh, the uh, influence of its first president, Horace Mann. Uh, small, liberal arts. Uh, religious in nature, the college had, despite ending its uh, affiliation with an ecclesiastical body in 1899, uh, continued to operate uh, in this framework. Um, and Morgan, as a trustee to this college that uh, was having a tough time, especially in the wake of the First World War, um, and was even seriously considering selling its campus to the uh, Young Men's Christian Association. Um, he seemed to be the only person on the board with um, new progressive, interesting, inventive ideas for uh, how to keep the college going. As the, <clears throat> uh, what happened not too long after his first meeting was the YMCA did not have the proposed funding uh, to purchase the campus, but the fact that it was turned over to them with a promise of money, I think tells you where the board, the board that Arthur joined was in its thinking. Um, and so Morgan and his wife Lucy brought to the, uh, to the college these ideas that they had uh, imbued themselves with uh, in the progressive era and also uh, came to uh, actually get to practice uh, at the Marine Park School. And so Morgan's ideas for self-sustainability of the college, self-sufficiency, uh, were going to include um, such things as uh, on-campus industries, and uh, he was going to get his opportunity to um, inject uh, a, a learn by doing curriculum into a, a, an existing liberal arts one. Uh, this is one of the first images uh, of the Antioch College campus under Arthur Morgan. As you can see, it was a, a busy place that required a lot of uh, construction. Uh, and this uh, little drawing is made by one of the more interesting faculty members that he hired at that time, uh, a historian named Hendrik Willem van Loen. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Arthur Morgan's ideas about uh, how to uh, make the college self-sustaining were uh, to create industries on campus that would produce products that could gen generate revenue uh, for the institution, uh, would provide jobs for students where they would get practical experience and also uh, earn money that would permit them to stay in college. And one of those industries was uh, the Antioch Art Foundry uh, created in the mid-1920s. And here they used a, uh, the college used a Renaissance uh, metal casting process called Lost Wax to create uh, beautiful works of uh, bronze sculpture, uh, one of which was uh, the bust of Arthur Morgan that is actually one of the first ones uh, that uh, uh, is still in the, uh, on the college campus in South Hall. Uh, Incidentally, there were also uh, companion busts created at the same time for two of the guys that hired Arthur Morgan in the first place, uh, Colonel Edward Deeds and Charles F. Kettering. These two uh, busts are at the Engineers Club of Dayton. And uh, until recently, uh, they thought that those busts were created by the sculptor who uh, created M Mount Rushmore and it was up to Antiochiana to prove that they were in fact homegrown. 
He also uh, helped develop the Antioch shoe, um, a uh, 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 sensible shoe, <laughs> uh, and really the first footwear designed uh, for uh, working women. Um, the uh, shoe was test marketed on campus. The, it was manufactured in Portsmouth, Ohio. And until the 1950s, uh, people could buy Antioch shoes uh, complete with uh, images of Antioch College uh, on them. Uh, the on-campus industries, despite the successes I just mentioned, weren't really enough uh, to uh, maintain the college's uh, revenue and uh, or uh, could provide enough jobs for the increasing number of students that Morgan's Antioch brought to campus. And so uh, the longest lasting and more successful component of Arthur's Learn by Doing uh, ideas is called cooperative education. Antioch College continues to practice cooperative education. And here we see uh, the kinds of jobs that uh, Antioch students went on uh, in the time that Arthur Morgan was president. Uh, it was a, a great a time of, uh, of expanding industry uh, and plenty of jobs were available. And it did, it not only gave students a practical experience in the, in the workplace, uh, it gave them uh, exposure to perhaps a career that they didn't know they wanted to do or showed them for sure that there was a career that they absolutely did not wanna do. And the interesting pra practical side of cooperative education for Arthur Morgan's Antioch was that you could send uh, effectively half your student body off campus at any one time uh, and therefore uh, double the number of students that you could accommodate without actually uh, building, for instance, a new dormitory. Um, so how I like to usually put that is while you're off campus at a job, some other student is sleeping in your bed. And that's, uh, that's how it went for uh, several years. The college has long since uh, uh, kind of a, has, it has a kind of abandoned the, the practice of the um, uh, sending half the students off and having people sh uh, share rooms in, the, in that way. And so the practical uh, impact on the college is uh, not nearly so significant as the educational value of cooperative education, which as I say, we still do. As an exercise in uh, self-sufficiency, uh, Morgan's Antioch also uh, produced its own power and electricity uh, in, in this building, uh, which still stands, uh, although it's no longer used um, across uh, Corey Street from the campus uh, in Glen Helen. <clears throat> Uh, that's uh, quite a story all by itself. Uh, Morgan really wasn't uh, uh, a teacher, but he loved to do it. And as you can see, uh, 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 would do so often outdoors and right underneath the, uh, uh, the uh, monument to Horace Mann, which was one of the few aspects of Antioch College that Arthur Morgan maintained uh, in, its, um, uh, in its promotional material. Uh, one of Morgan's crowning achievements uh, was, uh, with the help especially of his wife, uh, cultivating uh, an Antioch dropout from the 1860s named Hugh Taylor Birch, who uh, was uh, a naturalist and a lawyer and a real estate developer and a really fascinating person. Uh, and also uh, the, the three of them, but primarily Birch, they got Birch back involved with the with the college that he had left and uh, bought up all the land across the street from Antioch College, gave it to the college as a nature preserve that was called Glen Helen, uh, which Antioch College owned until last year. Uh, Morgan's house, uh, he built it in 1919. Uh, one of the things that he did with his house uh, was um, make it available to the college community and uh, ultimately gave it to Antioch College. Um, his commitment to community can be exemplified here by the cooperative <clears throat> dining and living arrangements that the Morgans uh, uh, allowed to take place in their home. And they didn't really need their house by 1933 to say the truth because Arthur Morgan had become uh, chair of the fir uh, first chair of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, still one of the largest public works projects uh, in American history. 
uh, Morgan uh, built 13 dams in the TVA system. And here he is inspecting one of them uh, with the president of the United States who gave him the job in the first place, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, and his wife, Eleanor, who uh, the first lady who uh, a lot of us think uh, is the reason for Morgan's appointment to that job in the first place. Uh, here again, Morgan got to uh, practice his social engineering, uh, building again a permanent uh, work, uh, a permanent settlement for the workers and created the town of Norris, Tennessee out of whole cloth, which uh, had similar impact to uh, what happened in Miami Conservancy District, which was more efficient worker. Uh, and, um, and the proof would have been uh, in his safety record, which was nearly spotless compared to other uh, public works projects of the era. Uh, Morgan uh, didn't last at TVA more than about five years. Uh, his lack of um, uh, kind of political acumen, he was really did not have a political bone in his body, uh, would cost him ultimately uh, as a member of, the, of this enormous public works project uh, within the context of the New Deal. And uh, Morgan would be fired by, T by FDR himself in 1938. He returned to Yellow Springs where uh, he created the organization Community Service Incorporated, which not only exists to this day, but is putting on this conference. Here he got a chance really to develop <clears throat> into uh, a philosopher of uh, small uh, community life. Uh, Morgan, uh, his interest in creating that more enlightened society I think he saw community service as a way to do it uh, one individual at a time, one small town at a time. And that these in fact were the, um, the bedrock of, uh, of American society in particular. Uh, in 1948, he was invited by the American Council on Education to participate in um, what, what was, uh, a newly established organization in the newly independent uh, country of India, uh, the, the uh, Universities uh, Commission. And that was uh, a suggestion made to the American Council on Education by a member of the State Department. I'd love to know who that was, uh, that Morgan was the right guy for the job. Um, I looked at the letter of uh, where it was asked if he would join this August body. Um, in the Arthur Morgan papers. And his response was, if you want me as a leading figure in higher education on this, uh, no. But if you want someone who will have a, a fresh, uh, non-traditional look at how uh, higher education should be done, uh, then I'm your man. And besides, I've never been to India. Uh, and so this was a great opportunity uh, for, uh, uh, for the Morgans. Uh, they spent a lot of time over the next two years uh, touring India, inspecting schools, and giving um, uh, recommendations. And just, as you can see, they were uh, uh, really nicely received in just about everywhere that they went. It was this work on the Universities Commission of India that uh, led to a meeting and a collaboration with a Kerala-based educator, uh, K. Viswanathan, known as Viswan. Uh, and together they created the Abode of Friends, which uh, is also called Matrana Katen. Matrana Katen continues to exist to this day. Um, and this is one of Morgan's most successful experiments in what we uh, often refer to as his social engineering. Uh, he used community service to promote uh, the uh, existence, development, and expansion of Matrona Caden for most of the rest of his life. Uh, as I mentioned, he uh, began to develop his philosophical bent and wrote several books uh, to uh, lay out uh, his ideas for how um, <clears throat> people could have more purpose in their lives, uh, how small communities and uh, could sustain themselves uh, economically, socially, uh, he wrote major uh, uh, works on his major works, his engineering projects, uh, and this is how uh, the last half of his life uh, went. He remained uh, most of his life a, a vigorous man, uh, again, a product of the progressive era where one of the components 
of, uh, of the movement was called muscular Christianity. Here, and here he is with John Morgan. I'm pretty sure that's who that is. You also would rarely ever see him uh, without a tie or without a shave. Uh, and one of the reasons I love this particular photograph, it actually goes back to the time when he was president of the college, uh, when, the, when Antioch was considering um, uh, ending its uh, uh, collegiate, intercollegiate football program, uh, Morgan's uh, input into this conversation was, if you want some exercise, why don't you just chop wood like I did? And as you can see, he did it well uh, uh, into his old age. Uh, when Morgan uh, died, he was in his late 90s, and uh, he and his wife Lucy, who preceded him in death, uh, both donated their bodies to the Ohio State Medical School. And once uh, <clears throat> after that, their bodies were cremated and returned to Yellow Springs. And here we see uh, the Morgan family uh, burying Arthur Morgan's ashes under this magnificent boulder that sits outside uh, one of Morgan's lasting monuments, Glen Helen, uh, a boulder that, uh, according to Lee's dad, who is uh, the man next to the rock, Ernest, uh, was uh, uh, picked, handpicked by Arthur to uh, uh, be moved uh, to Glen Helen. And I thank you very much. Scott, that was really incredible. Thank you so much. Um, again, if folks have question? questions, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say we have time for questions. Yes, yes. I was going to say if people have questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, and a reminder that many of the things Scott talked about we'll be hearing more in depth over the course of the next few days. But Scott, since we are talking about Arthur Morgan's legacy, I was wondering if you could share with us who are the people who um, come to learn about Arthur Morgan at the archives? Oh, that's a great question. They come from a variety of places. Uh, one of them is uh, a man that this organization is familiar with, uh, Dr. Aaron Purcell. Uh, he and I kind of grew up together in the Arthur Morgan papers. He was uh, working on his master's thesis uh, when I started interning. He is a good archetype for most of the people who start, who begin their interest with Arthur Morgan with his engineering. And then they come to find as they study more deeply that he is a complex, interesting, multifaceted figure. Uh, and so for instance, uh, Aaron's first um, uh, interest then expanded into articles that he wrote about Morgan preventing the building of the Kinzu Dam, Morgan's role in the League to Enforce Peace, Morgan's role in education uh, with Matrona Caton. Um, <clears throat> just last week, we had a visitor from the, uh, um, Command and General Staff College of Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Wow. <laughs> uh, an, an environmental historian who uh, uh, helps uh, Army majors become colonels and generals. Uh, and he came specifically to study uh, Morgan's uh, drainage work in um, uh, Arkansas and Minnesota. Um, we have had recent reference with uh, members of the CELO community, which Morgan helped uh, start, well, Morgan did start, with the help of um, other like-minded people um, to find out his relationship uh, specifically with uh, a man named William Regnery who helped start CELO community. Um, so, uh, and uh, many years ago, uh, uh, Viswan came to visit from Matrona Caden. Uh, and so uh, that would be another, they kind of come from, it's, it's interesting how many different directions people come uh, to examine Arthur Morgan. Yeah, thank you very much, Scott. And, and to that point, if people um, listening to this are interested in learning more about Morgan, obviously he wrote many, many books, some of which are, are pretty dense. Um, and then there are biographies about Morgan. Where would you suggest people start if they're interested in learning more about Arthur Morgan, especially if they're not able to visit you in the archives? Aaron uh, Purcell wrote a pretty comprehensive biography, which came about three, four years ago. Um, and so that one's just called Arthur Morgan. Uh, and so that's an academic broad study of his entire uh, life. Uh, there's a really heartfelt 
um, and uh, admiring biography written by his son, Ernest. Um, and actually most of what's been written about Arthur is more admiring than not. Uh, and that would be uh, the f one of the first major biographies of Morgan was written by <clears throat> Uh, an Antioch student who had been an assistant of Morgan's name, uh, uh, Walter Cahill. Um, you, uh, reading Morgan's books himself, you get certainly a pretty direct uh, exposure to his thinking. Um, I think one of the best uh, and accessible books of, of his uh, is called Industries for Small Communities, uh, which uh, is especially straight on uh, uh, Yellow Springs, Ohio, a place where he uh, spent a, 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 most of his life, I suppose. Great. Um, thank you, Scott. We have a question from Truth Garrett. Can you speak more about Arthur Morgan's involvement in building actual communities? Certainly. In the case of uh, engineering, he literally, uh, you know, headed up development of, uh, of housing. Uh, and uh, facilities uh, for workers who were building these massive dam projects. Uh, in the case of Antioch College, he was uh, in charge of Antioch College and could uh, uh, promote these uh, ideas of, of a shared uh, communal community life. Uh, but in this case, of course, the community was already there. He, he built the Antioch, uh, uh, student body rather significantly and the faculty so he was able to make that one uh, double and triple its previous size uh, and he would encourage uh, involvement in uh, decision making on how on how campus governance would uh, would go uh, but his uh, he kind of just gave that a start and subsequent presidents of the college would really develop it into the governance uh, system that uh, Antioch prides itself on and is often known for. <clears throat> uh, he built the town of Norris, Tennessee, for sure. He uh, also had um, uh, uh, a lot to do with the, the way Silo community was, was formed. Um, and in the case of Matrona Caton, uh, he was primarily its advocate and promoter. Uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from all the way over the United States. Uh, and so these are probably some, some specific examples of his uh, approach to building communities. Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. And I, I did want to say that tomorrow morning we have somebody speaking about intentional communities and someone else, uh, Emily Seibel, speaking of land trust, because Arthur Morgan was a pioneer of community land trust as well as intentional communities, a different kind of community maybe than, than Norris, Tennessee. But thank, mm -hmm. thank you so much for that. Um, April is asking... Uh, where in Morgan's time did the students of Antioch come from? Were they primarily from Ohio or were they from around the country? They were from around the country. And I think the college had some of its first international students uh, uh, under Morgan, especially in the, in the 20s, a number of Chinese students came. Uh, but uh, one of Morgan's many talents was for promotion. And uh, the, um, the publicity that uh, the college uh, received in all of these changes that he'd made to it and the expansion of the student body resulted in uh, students coming from all over the country. But the college has always primarily relied on Ohio. Thank you for that. I see a really great question from J.W. Hammond, which really gets to the heart of why we are here today. He says, great presentation, Scott. You started your talk by mentioning that Morgan remains relevant as a model of what it might mean to promote a more enlightened society. Are there any specific lessons or cautions related to Morgan's life that you'd commend to our attention as things to think carefully about today? Ooh. I know. <laughs> James's questions are always so difficult to answer. Uh, uh, so uh, something that we should do to pursue enlightenment is something that Arthur did, and that is never stop reading. Uh, uh, he was a voracious reader. He's often referred to as an autodidact. <clears throat> um, 
his uh, how his ideas remain relevant is uh, particularly how it seems, as I said at the outset, we become we increasingly become less enlightened as a society. Um, I need to go back and read this some more. Uh, lessons or cautions related to Morgan's life. Morgan what, uh, developed visions and attitudes uh, and stuck to them. And so perhaps a caution that you could have with Morgan would be uh, maybe to uh, uh, be a little bit more flexible in the worldview that you have formed for yourself. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that this could be uh, exemplified would be he lost his job at the Tennessee Valley Authority primarily because he thought the tactics that worked for him during the progressive era would always work. And uh, it was his approach to effectively, he saw corruption in his own organization. And just like he did in 1912, when he uh, tried to stop the Florida Everglades from being developed, uh, he uh, made a big uh, splash in the papers and called for uh, in, you know, government investigations into these corruptions. That worked really well uh, before the First World War and in the New Deal, it cost him his job because it brought too much, uh, as the president saw it, negative public relations uh, to, uh, uh, to what was the most controversial component of the New Deal, the TBA. Thanks so much, Scott. That was that was very interesting. And I'm reminded as I'm looking at these questions, how much uh, Morgan's kind of questioning uh, became a part of the Antioch psyche, because we have some really good questions from Antioch uh, alum and uh, friends, uh, including this one from Mark Pomerantz. Scott, Morgan is an interesting historical figure. Oops, I'm missing. Sorry. But can you speak more about how his ideas are relevant to taking Antioch into a more successful direction today? For example, developing a curriculum more specific to training leaders who can understand and work with a messy world we find ourselves in full of wicked problems. And that's a big question. I know that Brooke and others from Antioch uh, will be speaking about that, but if you have a few minute answer, we'd love to hear it. How his ideas are relevant to take Enoch in a more successful direction today. I'm not sure I know enough about the landscape of higher education to know how Morgan's ideas would be uh, uh, would be successful. Successful, of course, is a, a, a pretty subjective term. Um, mostly the college since Morgan has stuck to the, uh, the basic ideas that Morgan brought to the college, uh, which were uh, practical forms of learning and, uh, and, and a whole community life. Um, we find, uh, for instance, that, um, you know, the young people of the last 20, 30 years aren't necessarily as prepared uh, or interested in, uh, in the creation of community. We've lived, as we're doing right now, in this kind of oddly isolated community that makes it uh, more difficult for us to adjust to the kinds of uh, relations that uh, that Morgan wanted, especially, um, he thought. Although I do think that this still applies, that uh, um, that a, at the broadest possible education is what creates uh, leaders. Uh, Morgan wanted, as as he wrote in a really great book of his, Education for Engineers. Uh, a term that is really kind of a pejorative, but I don't see it that way, and that's dilettantes. People that knew uh, really a little bit about a lot of things uh, and that equipped with that, um, people had a potential to become, uh, to become leaders in their field. But I, think it's open to, but, I think, but I think it's open to question. It's a difficult one to answer. Yeah, thank you. It, it is difficult. And I see all kinds of great questions now in the chat that will be um, fielded by our um, education panel and our um, business panel. And we do want it to have at least a five minute break. But I did. I, one thing I wanted to ask, Scott, I, I understand that Morgan was a man of his time. And I have heard that his, you know, sometimes 
getting stuck in particular ideas and unable to change. But I've also heard folks talk about him as being a really um, a, a idea of a holistic person who had equal parts left brain and right brain. And so in that, in that way, really a very modern sort of person. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about ways that he is sort of a man, not just of his time, but then a man for the 21st century. He certainly, uh, that left and right brain person uh, together and did look uh, you know, forward to the future. One of his uh, uh, more significant works was about um, the futurist Edward Bellamy, uh, who um, he took. He drew a lot of ideas from uh, for uh, for for future society. Uh, he, there was certainly no limit to what he wanted to learn and understand about the world, even as he still remained uh, rigidly committed to the. Um, to the tenets of the progressive era. Um, he still always knew what was best for you, uh, which, I, which again is the, uh, and he was, you know, and sometimes he was going to enforce that. Uh, he created, uh, therefore, you know, uh, he, I shouldn't say he created, he inspired others um, uh, who became virtual devotees uh, of Morgan. Uh, at the same time, his, uh, uh, his ways also created uh, no shortage of, of detractors and ultimately uh, enemies. Uh, not that Morgan saw them as enemies, but uh, there was no question that the uh, Army Corps of Engineers saw Arthur Morgan as an enemy. Uh, but uh, illustrative uh, would be uh, one time I interviewed uh, a member of the class of 1936, Barry Hollister, uh, about um, hit, uh, when he was put in charge, he was a member of the faculty too, when he was put in charge of the college's sesquicentennial or centennial celebration in 1953, I did the sesquicentennial. Um, <laughs> and Barry's job was to bring distinguished speakers to campus, tour them around, and every one of them was supposed to have a meal with Arthur Morgan. In this particular occasion, Barry was hosting uh, a scientist uh, named Linus Pauling. Uh, Pauling, by the way, is the only person in history to win Nobel Prizes in two different fields, uh, chemistry and peace. And so as Barry related, uh, Morgan and Pauling sat down to their meal where they talked about the latest uh, readings uh, that they had done in the field of telekinesis, moving things with your mind. And they did not speak to of it as Barry suggested in theoretical terms at all about how it was possible. And he was astonished that both of these men had really read the latest literature on this very esoteric subject, especially in the 1950s. Uh, and so this seems to be uh, uh, something that would be on a track of uh, Arthur's uh, patterns of, uh, you know, continuing his own self-improvement. And that would be one of the things that, um, that we could probably take from him in the long range. And that is continually improving ourselves. Yeah, that's really, that's a beautiful way to end. Thank you so much, Scott. It was a terrific presentation, great answers, great dialogue in the chat. I think it's, we couldn't have started out this uh, symposia in a better way. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, folks can find you um, via email or yep. by stopping by the archives. And we will- With permission be under pandemic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to and we will be. We're going to take a five minute break. So we'll be joining again around 1102 with uh, Brooke Bryan, who will be kicking off our education panel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott.